Nice to see you all on this lovely March evening. It's not snow, right? We're happy with this. Um, just a couple of, this is the last of our lecture series, the last installment tonight, so I want to just give you an idea of a couple of things that are coming up in the future. Um, one is on uh, April 16th at 10 in the morning, that's a Saturday morning, um, our annual Historical Society meeting, and the um, uh, lecture that Richard will be giving is called In a Flash, Rare Portrait Photographs from the Collection and uh, got a postcard this week on it. It had a wonderful photograph on the front, so I think that might be really interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Also, a couple of exhibits that are gonna be here this summer. One is called Living Well is the Best Revenge, and that's about the Murphy family in the jazz age in the 1920s. Um, Mrs. Murphy was a Wyborg, so that tells you something. And the other is Bon Voyage, the Woodhouse family on the Grand Tour, 1885. So that should be another interesting one. Um, tonight we're talking about, oh, I, wanted, I do want to thank LTV publicly for doing our lectures for us every month. They do a wonderful job of recording them. People all the time are telling me how they see them on LTV, and I'm so happy that other people get to see them because, as you can see, we have a standing room only crowd tonight. There are a couple of seats up here if anybody wants them. There are two seats right over here. Um, and there's one seat right here. So there are places to sit for those of you standing in the back. Uh, tonight, Bob Hefner is going to speak to us. Bob is a wonderful um, uh, resource for us. Um, he's the Director of Historic Service for, Services for the Village of East Hampton. And he's going to talk to us about the Domini shops. Uh, a lot of people are interested in what's going on with the Domini shops. It's um, a bit of a mystery, but he's going to fill you all in tonight about what the plans are for the Domini shops. So I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure you are too. Bob? Thank you, Barbara. Here we have the, or do you want to turn those lights out that are on the screen? We're not. There we go. <laughs> so you can see what we're talking about. So here we have the legendary Dominey House on North Main Street. And here live the prominent craftsmen Nathaniel Dominey IV, Nathaniel Dominey V, and Felix Dominey. Clock makers, furniture makers, and millwrights. Our little clock shop where they did their clockwork is on the left here. And the woodworking shop is on the other side of the house where they did the cabinet work and mill gears and things like that. And that was over here. And on the back wall, this is the uh, woodworking shop that extended a little bit into the house and extended out beyond it so there could be a window to light the workbench. <clears throat> the original house, probably built in the early um, 18th century, is a single salt box house from the chimney over to this ridge. The uh, clock shop is about, I mean, the woodworking shop's about 1798, or 1750, rather. And uh, maybe that was built when the rest of the house was expanded to the north. The clock shop is 1798. <clears throat> in 1946, the house was demolished but the clock shop and the woodworking shop were saved by Dudley Roberts Jr., who moved them to his property on Further Lane. After 70 years on the ocean dune, they are about to be donated to the village and moved back to their original site. This lecture is the story of these shops and of the Dom Domini legacy. It is a story with ample frustration, sadness, and regret, and also a story of those whose efforts have sustained the Domini legacy. In particular, Dan Hopping, who recorded the Dominey House and Shops in 1940. Dudley Roberts, Jr., who rescued the shops from demolition in 1946. And in 1959, decided that they should stay in East Hampton rather than go to Winterthur Museum. And Charles Hummel, whose work at Winterthur and whose book with Hammer in Hand, and whose continued efforts, including lectures here in Clinton Academy only a couple of years ago, <coughs> have made us aware of the value and national significance of all the Domini tools, furniture documents, and these workshops, which taken together are a unique resource for understanding early American craftsmen. 
next slide. So this is where the Domini House uh, stood on North Main Street. Uh, in this his historic photo, you can see way on the right-hand side uh, the brick building, which is East Hampton Grill. The Domini Barn right here uh, is about where the entrance to the parking lot is. And the clock shop was about right over here. So the, the whole house was on this little green area between North Main Street and the parking lot. Next slide. This photo of 1940 shows the interior of the woodworking shop. Uh, the workbench is now at Wintertree Museum. Through the door on the right is the kitchen, through which when they were working in there in the wintertime, maybe some warm air uh, came in through the kitchen. Next slide. This is the clock shop interior in 1940 with the uh, tool racks still full. Next slide. Some historic uh, events, people, and places become lost in history. The Dominique craftsmen were not forgotten. Many of the farmhouses on Main Street had a tall case clock in the parlor made by Nathaniel Dominey IV or Nathaniel Dominey V, with the name of the maker often inscribed on the clock face. And you can see Dominey up there on the top. Uh, no one forgot who made the clock. And with the Dominies living in the Dominey house until 1941, no one forgot that these clocks were made in the little clock shop attached to that house. This clock was made by Nathaniel Dominey IV in 1809 for Joseph Osborne, who lived in the Osborne Jackson house. The works were made in the little clock shop, and the cherry case was made in the woodworking shop. Next slide. Nathaniel Dominey V built the Hook Mill in 1806. This mill was owned by Nathaniel Dominey VII for much of the 19th century, and he kept the reputation of his grandfather alive. When the Dominey House was threatened with demolition in 1941, those interested in saving it noted that the grandfather clocks were made in the clock shop, and the rounds for the mill gears were turned on a lathe in the woodworking shop. Next slide. The furniture the Dominies made was less well known at that time. It really was not until Charles Hummel wrote with hammer in hand in 1968 that all the objects made in the clock shop and woodworking shop became fully appreciated. On the left is the desk and bookcase Nathaniel Dominey V made for John Lyon Gardner in 1800. And on the right is a chest on chest made by Nathaniel Dominey V in 1796 for his own family. And that was in the Dominey house and was purchased uh, from it by a collector before it was demolished. Next slide. Later in the 19th century and right up to the time the house was demolished, it was recognized as one of East Hampton's picturesque landmarks and visited by artists and photographers. And this is an etching by Child Hassam of the back of the house. And again, the woodworking shop is these two windows, this section of the house right here. Next. This is an 1887 photograph of the interior of the woodworking shop. A workbench is on the left. Through the doorway, we see a chair in the kitchen. A saddle is resting on the lathe to the right of the door, right there. And then we have a, a uh, pinion gear from the hook mill on the floor. Next slide. This photo of the front door taken by Ted Borzig in 1940 was published in Pencil Points magazine. You can see the wisteria vine going under the clapboards, the seaweed insulation pushing out from the wall frame. Can anything be more picturesque? When the Dominey House was uh, threatened with demolition in 1946, the Star reported, or when actually when it was being demolished, the Star reported that the Brooklyn Museum had wanted this whole assembly the millstones, the doorway, the window, and the wall frame uh, to put in their museum, but the carpenters had not waited for them. And as it turns out, Ethel Marsden, an antique dealer in Southampton, purchased the double door. And for all we know, this door could uh, be in existence somewhere today. Next slide. In May 1940, two young architects came to East Hampton to record the Dominey House and the Thomas Osborne House in Wainscott 
for the Historic American Building Survey. They were Daniel Hopping from Manhattan and Carl Stowe from Sayville. From 1935 to 1941, the Historic American Building Survey was administered by the Works Progress Administration to provide jobs uh, to architects during the Great Depression. The Osborne House and the Dominey House were quite similar, as it turns out. Both architects did the field measurements for both houses, and Dan Hopping did the final drawings for the Dominey House, and Carl Stowe did the final drawings for the, uh, Wayne, for the Wayne Scott, Osborne House and Wayne Scott. As it turns out, they were both uh, half salt box houses that were later expanded. This is the Osborne House and Wayne Scott, the Dominey House. On the right, again, with a little clock shop with some other elevations of it, the original part of the house, the addition, and then the woodworking shop over on the far right. Next slide. Uh, the two architects, Mr. Hopping and Mr. Stowe, concentrated on the clock shop. So here's the floor plan of the Dominey House. We have the clock shop here with the uh, chimney with this forge and fireplace in the center of it. The woodworking shop over here with two workbenches lighted by the windows, a ladder up to the loft above, and that connected right to the kitchen, uh, two parlors in the front, a little bedroom and a pantry. Next slide. And this is the drawings of the clock shop uh, with the forge and little fireplace in the work area. The lathe in the, and over on the right is the lathe in the clock shop and even the little, the little uh, wood stool. Next slide. And the floor plan of the clock shop here with the benches all around with a window in each wall to light the benches for the work that was taking place there. <clears throat> and the elevations with the work benches and the uh, tool racks above. Next slide. Along with the 14 sheets of measured drawings, the archive, which is at the Library of Congress, also includes field notebooks, which contain about 150 pages of sketches like these. Here are Dan Hopping and Carl Stowe's original pencil drawings of the beaded clabbers on the left, the window muntins, a wrought iron door latch, the foot scraper that was in the millstone, and the, even the andirons in the clock shop fireplace. Next slide. The Historic American Building Survey also sent out a professional photographer uh, named Stanley Mixon, and his four by five negatives are also at the Library of Congress. On the right is the clock shop forge. In May of 1940, no one knew the fate of the Domini House and how fortunate we are that these drawings and photographs were made. They provided major documentation for the Domini display at Winotour, and they will enable the forthcoming restoration of the actual shops by the village. Next slide. Dan Hopping continued to contribute to East Hampton later in his career. In the 70s, he worked with Adelaide de Manille and Ted Carpenter on the historic houses and barns they assembled at Further Lane, which are now our East Hampton Town Hall. Uh, Dan Hopping is on the right and Ted Carpenter is on the left. And does anyone recognize the two architects in the center? <laughs> yeah. Tony DeSuno and Clay Mori. <laughs> Next slide. The last Domini to live in the house was Charles Domini, whose great grandfather was uh, Nathaniel Domini V. In 1939, the village returned the hook mill to running order, and Charles Puff Domini became one of the millers. Here he is at the door of the hook mill. Puff Domini lived alone in the Domini house. In a 1941 profile uh, in the Star, he was described as giving tours of the house to gawking tourists and souvenir hunters who come in amused and leave admiring. In November 1941, the Star reported that Puff, who had been grinding all cornmeal at the hook mill, turned his attention to wheat. And quoting from the article in the Star, it's very appropriate that the very first flour to be ground here this week is used by Mrs. Norman Barnes in her old East Hampton fruitcake. 
Combined with California fruits, the East Hampton flour makes the cake a truly American product. Since the New York Herald Tribune article about Mrs. Barnes' fruitcake appeared a couple of weeks ago, she has had daily orders from distant points. And in tracing the, what, these events of 1941 uh, in the star, there's, there's no warning. And actually, a few days after this article was published about the, the fruitcake mm -hmm. and the flour, Charles Darmody sold the house to Oscar Brill and moved to Massachusetts, where his son lived. And I don't know that anyone uh, knows the reason for this sudden abandonment after the tenancy of seven generations of Dominies in, in the Dominey house. So on the right, we have uh, uh, Frank Brill, Oscar Brill's son, at the door of the Dominey house. And of course, Oscar Brill owned the store adjoining to the, to the south, which is now East Hampton Florist. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, this is the front page of the Star, December 18th, 1941. And Mayor Judson Bannister, this is his photograph on the right uh, when he was running for re-election in 1942. And right up here is the letter, an appeal from Mayor, uh, Mayor Bannister to the people of East Hampton. To the lovers of old East Hampton, I'm writing this notice to call to the attention of the public the fact that the old Dominey House on North Main Street is about to be torn down. The property has been purchased by Mr. Oscar Brill, who has agreed to postpone the demolition for a short time. The purpose of writing this letter is to see if we could raise enough money by public subscription to purchase this property and restore the house so as to save one of the oldest houses in East Hampton. The house contains many patterns of the machinery now used in the Hook Mill. Many of the watchmaker's tools used in making the old Dominey grandfather's clock are still there. The price asked by Mr. Brill is $6,000. It is only through the public spirit of Mr. Brill that this property may be purchased for the purpose of a museum. I would like to hear from all who are interested at once, uh, Judson L. Bannister, Mayor. A few days later, Nelson Osborne did write to Mayor Bannister saying, it would seem to me a distinct loss to the community if this building should be destroyed, and I shall be glad to make a contribution. Uh, but apparently few others step forward. And if we look at, the, at, the, at this newspaper some more, we see on the right the headline, uh, Reports Conflict on Death of Hadel at Pearl Harbor. His cable received here after Navy Department reports death. This is December 18, 11 days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, this article on the right lets us know that William Haydell Jr. from Amagansett was gunner's mate on board the USS West Virginia. His family had received a telegram from the Navy saying that Haydell had been killed in the raid. But later that same day, Haydell cabled his father, still kicking, pay my insurance. <laughs> <laughs> the Star article concluded, it is no doubt true that no news is good news, and for that reason, families of servicemen who have not heard from them since the Pearl Harbor bombing are not unduly alarmed. It is expected within a day or two, letters will be received from the men who were stationed there. On the left is the headline, Airplane Spotters to Have Lookout Tower at Springs. And here, I.Y. Halsey, the chief observer, was requesting donations to build a tower at Fireplace to be manned 24 hours a day by 50 volunteers. And then there's also the honor roll there of East Hampton men serving in the Army, Navy, and Marines. So this was not a good time uh, to ask people to turn their attention to saving the Dominey House. Next slide. Oscar Brill did not tear the house down right away. It lingered on empty. This photograph was taken by Robert Brill, Oscar Brill's son, in 1942. In August 1942, Oscar Brill offered to give the sh clock shop to the village to be moved to Memorial Green uh, next to the Hook Mill, but no action was taken. Next slide. Finally, demolition started in February 1946. Brill told the Star that the house had become a fire hazard and that accidents through prowlers who occasionally entered and slept there might result in lawsuits. 
By this time, the family had moved some tools to Clinton Academy, and Ethel Marsden, owner of Windmill Galleys in Southampton, had purchased the remaining tools and workbenches. The article in the Star noted that this may have been the house in the village most worthy, most, most worthy of preservation. A writer commented, I think it is very sad that the old Dominic house is being torn down, that the community would allow this house to be destroyed. All the essential construction was still sound and the community had a chance to keep it. Next slide. Here we come to the man, Dudley Roberts Jr., who saved the two workshops from being demolished. This is his portrait from the volume uh, Second 50 Years of the Maidstone Club, <clears throat> of which he was president from 1957 to 1961. Dudley Roberts was well known for his interest and support of East Hampton institutions, especially the library and the LVIS, where he was a major contributor to the restoration of the Gardner House on Main Street. In the Maidstone Club history, Avril Geis described how the Dominique clock shop and woodworking shop came to be saved by Dudley Roberts. In 1946, he returned from Mexico City, where he had worked for the State Department at the U.S. Embassy. Arriving in East Hampton, he stopped to see Wallace Chauncey, who remarked, isn't it a shame about the Dominique House? On impulse, Mr. Roberts went to North Main Street to see the extent of the demolition and promptly purchased two sections of the ancient house before they were destroyed. This photograph shows what Dudley Roberts <clears throat> must have seen. And we see here that the, although demolition is well along, we see the clock shop is standing here and the woodworking shop is over here, still intact. Another day and it may have been too late. Next slide. And here is the clock shop with uh, John G. Collins on the left and Charles Squires on the right, <clears throat> preparing it to be moved to Dudley Roberts' property on Further Lane. Next slide. Dudley Roberts joined the two shops into one building set on the dune. The clock shop is on the left. The woodworking shop uh, is on the right. It has a Dudley Roberts replaced the lean-to roof with the gable roof you see here. The concrete block retaining wall was for a kitchen and bathhouses that were under the woodworking shop set in the dune. Next slide. And here, this is a photograph taken um, during construction. Uh, this photograph, a scan of this photograph actually and some others arrived today from Whittier Museum, thanks to the efforts of Glenn Purcell and Charlie Hummel, who had recently found the collection of material that um, was made when the curators from Winterthur came to look at the real clock shop, Dudley Roberts clock shops. <clears throat> I guess they took some, some of their own photographs, their own sketches, and I guess Dudley Roberts gave them some, some old pictures, this being one of them. And you can see here how, uh, the so this what you see here is the clock shop, the exterior wall clock shop being set inside the gable end wall of the carpenter shop. So it was kind of a nice, a nice resolution, a nice way to join the two buildings together. And in the foreground is the timber frame of the carpenter shop. Next slide. I'd never seen a photo of the interior of when it was at Dudley Roberts until this afternoon. And this is, this is one of them. This is um, the Domini shops became a clubhouse, a men's club. They call themselves the St. Augustine Monks. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what that's, so it looks quite different from um, what it does look like now, as far as the decor is concerned. Uh, next slide. And this is the interior today, <clears throat> looking from the woodworking shop uh, back at the shingled wall of the clock shop uh, set into it. Yeah. No, the kitchen no, no. was connected to the woodwork. Well, yes, I think you're right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the uh, frame of the re original rear wall of the woodworking shop. And on the right, 
we haven't really had a chance to look at this thing too closely yet, but right here is the date 1791 carved into this brace uh, right here. Next slide. On the left is a, a corner post, roof plate, tie beam, wall studs and braces. And on the right is the gun stock end of the plate where this addition of the woodworking shop joined the original house. So in other words, they had this gun stock to have put a big tenon that could go into this post to be connected to the existing house. Next slide. This is the inside of the clock shop looking, that door goes to the woodworking shop. Uh, original timber frame, corner posts, the original pine wall paneling. And the ladder is actually from the woodworking shop where it was used to go up to the loft above. Next slide. <clears throat> now we move to the Winter Tour Museum chapter of the story. On an antiquing trip to Long Island in 1957, the Connecticut dealer Rockwell Gardner visited the barn at Windmill Galleries in Southampton and was amazed at the collection of about a thousand antique tools that Ethel Marsden had purchased from the Dominey House 10 years earlier. Rockwell Gardner purchased, uh, contacted the director of Winnetour, who in turn received approval from Henry Francis DuPont to purchase the collection. This began the process of establishing the Domini Shops exhibit at Winnetour, which opened in 1960. And the woodworking shop is, on, is here and here, and this is the clock shop at Winnetour. Next slide. Right in Clinton Academy. Charles Hummel became assistant curator at Winter Tour Museum in 1958 and was there practically at the beginning of the Dominey project. His book with hammer in hand astonished East Hampton residents who discovered the national significance of the collection of Dominey tools, manuscripts, and objects related to the family. Over the years, Mr. Hummel has tirelessly promoted an awareness and appreciation of the Dominey family of craftsmen and here he is in Clinton Academy in 2012. Next slide. Now, if you were a curator at Winterthur in 1959 with this collection of 1,000 tools, uh, including the workbenches and the big lathes, and you had the goal of using the Domini tool collection to demonstrate how 18th century cabinet makers and clock makers worked in their shops, you would naturally want the real thing. On the left is the clock shop interior in 1940, and on the right is the same wall today, and you can see the same paneling, the little uh, <clears throat> window shutter, the ghosts of where the, tool, the racks were for the tools, and the shelves. What could be better than having the, the real authentic shop? Jeanette Edwards Rattray wrote in the Star in 1959 that Dudley Roberts was offered a fabulous sum for the clock shop by the DuPonts for Winnetour. Dudley Roberts wrote to Everett Rattray in 1965, I would like to point out that the curator of Winnetour expressed a desire to purchase the original clock shop, and because of my feeling that it should not go out of East Hampton, his request was turned down. I subsequently offered the clock to the East Hampton Historical, the clock shop to the East Hampton Historical Society and even offered to pay for its removal to any location in East Hampton. This offer was never accepted. Although Mr. DuPont and his staff have done a magnificent job of recreating the clock shop, I now regret that they do not have the original to go along with the original tools and furniture. So we find out that Dudley Roberts for East Hampton saved the Domini shops twice. Once in 1946, when he moved him to his property, and once in 1959, when he declined the offer to have the shops move to Winnetour. He lived to regret that second decision, believing that East Hampton did not care. It's up, to us now, it's up to us now to show that Dudley Roberts' decision to keep the shops in East Hampton was finally, after 60 years, the right choice. Next slide. In 1966, a year after his letter expressing regret in not letting Winterthur have the shops, Dudley Roberts gave them to his neighbors, 
Theodore and Elizabeth Weicker, who moved them a short distance to the east. Clay Morey designed a small addition to the shops at that time. And just a few days ago, Fran Morey gave to the Historical Society some photos that Clay had taken of the shops in 1966. And this is Clay's photo of the interior of the woodworking shop um, just after he had uh, done it for the Wikers. Next slide. From 1966 to the present, the shops have remained on the Weicker property. Again, the clock shop on the left, the woodworking shop on the right. And this is as they are today. <clears throat> Elizabeth Weicker married Anastasios Fondaros in 1971, and it was from Elizabeth Fondaros that Chris Brown purchased the property in 2001. Mayor Paul Rickenback saw an opportunity for the village and reached out to Chris Brown, who did offer to give the shops to the village when he redeveloped the property. At the same time, the village purchased the parking lot on North Main Street, and when the lot was repaved, the grass area in front was widened by 20 feet to accommodate the original footprint of the Domini House in anticipation of moving the shops there. Sadly, Chris Brown passed away in 2009 before plans for this property and a gift of the Domini shops could be realized. In 2013, the village included the Domini shops in the group of 23 buildings designated as timber frame landmarks, thereby giving the village some control over their future. Next slide. Now the Further Lane property has a new owner who is redeveloping the site, and the Domini clock shop and Domini woodworking shop will be donated to the village. And any day now, they will be moved to Mulford Farm to be kept safe while their final assembly on North Main Street is planned and prepared. And once again, this is uh, where they're going to go, and the clock shop was right, pretty much right there, extending over to about the woodworking shop over here. Next slide. Our vision for the site is to place the clock shop and the carpenter shop at their original locations and to join them with a reconstruction of the Domini House that would serve as an interpretation center. This would be a timber frame shell with a restored exterior and an open interior for the display and interpretation of Domini furniture documents and objects. This reconstruction will allow the two shops to be in their original context connected by the frame of the Domini House. This new museum would be a partnership between the village and the East Hampton Historical Society, which would provide programming, exhibits, furniture, and tools for interpreting the work of the Domini family. Imagine a beautiful timber frame shell uh, full of Domini furniture and displays with doors opening to the authentic clock shop and woodworking shop. Next slide. A reconstruction of the timber frame and exterior of the Domini House is possible because of the drawings made by Dan Hopping in 1940. Here is a section uh, showing the timber frame and even a detail of the cornice molding. On the right profile of, the, of that great hood over the front door, 14 sheets of drawings, 150 pages of field sketches, many historic photographs, including the very high-resolution uh, Habs photographs taken in 1940, uh, make a completely authentic reconstruction of the timber frame and exterior possible. Next slide. The East Hampton Historical Society owns about 50 pieces of Domini furniture and other objects made in these shops. And here are some Domini chairs in the Society's collection that can be displayed in the interpretation area between the workshops. Next slide. And the society owns five Domini clocks. Uh, the tall chest on the left, many other pieces, including uh, the two candle stands on the right, which also can be part of a display at the Domini shop complex. Next slide. And just this past year, a collector from Southampton, Stephen Mannheimer, learned about the plans for the Domini shops and donated to the Historical Society about 200 tools from the Domini clock shop. 
that he had acquired from the same Ethel Marsden's Windmill Antiques in Southampton uh, in a box apparently overlooked um, by others. <clears throat> and uh, so they were still there, and they include some really terrific tools that were in the actual clock shop. Next slide. Now we'll close with another uh, what goes around comes around story. On the left are the original columns that Nathaniel Dominey Five made in his workshop on North Main Street for Clinton Academy. So if you looked out that window um, almost 100 years ago, you'd see them. In 1921, when Clinton Academy was being restored, a mason working on the job, William Kelsey, took these two columns to his house in Amagansett and used them to prop up floor girders in his cellar. <laughs> Thank goodness. This house was on Abraham's Landing Road, <clears throat> uh, where Carlton Kelsey grew up. He told me about these columns, and years later, when Richard Behrens and I had the opportunity to see them, we were truly astounded to go down in the little cellar hole and find these down there. And they were recently donated to the Historical Society, and it can also be part of the Dominey Shop Assembly at North Main Street. Thank you. I don't know if we can lure him back for questions, but I did want to note that we do, we do have a model, which I'm pretty sure was made by Ralph Carpentier for a tool exhibit here 25 years ago. And if you'll walk up and look at it, you can look in and see the lathe. And typical of someone like Ralph, eye for detail, you'll see that the little bench that was illustrated, the little stool. That little stool he reproduced and is in there. So that's really worth looking at. Robert, do you want to answer questions or just forget it? <laughs> I think it's forget it. Have a nice evening. Right.